Please be seated. Let us pray. Well, God, you manifest in your servants the signs of your presence. Send forth upon us the spirit of love that in companionship with one another, your abounding grace may increase among us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So as that prayer sort of, you can turn it down a little bit. So as that prayer sort of mentions, I really do see God in people. And I have to tell you, therefore, about one of the best friends that I've ever had. His name's Norman, and he's a retired gastroenterologist. He's the jazz king. And he also is a green thumb with a passion for camellias. I miss him. You know, there's something about being in the presence of someone who is 40 years my senior and whose zest for life is so palpable that the room around him, right, takes its energy from him. That has me wondering if I will ever see a waitress serenaded by harmonica ever again. Norman is that guy, complete with a fishing shirt and a sailor's cap. Didn't matter where Norman and I found ourselves, he always brought something to the table. Wisdom, experience, and a killer sense of humor. And I remain thankful for the countless ways he reached out to me, this young priest, and took me under his wing. One of my favorite memories of Norman was on our many lunch trips where the aforementioned harmonica incident happened. It was only the finest establishments for Norman and I with Golden Corral topping the list. On several occasions, he would sit back with probably one of the widest grins I had ever seen, watching people load up their plates and then head back to their table. I think he found it funny because he knew biologically what was gonna happen later or that, he might have, or that he might have to go see them or something, I don't know. But there was this one time when this young kid walked by us and he had so many king crab legs on his plate that he had to like look around it to get back to his mom and dad and Norman took off his hat and he looks at him and he goes, all right. I loved him, I love him and his sense of humor. I love him because he admires beauty, and he'd always take the chance to share it with others. Whether that meant lunch, a chat, a concert, or invariably, finding the perfect camellia blossom on the many bushes outside the church, where he'd go and he'd cut it, he'd put it in a vase, and he'd leave it on your desk just for you. I think where he shined and still shines is in passing on the wisdom of how to care for living things. And I guess you could say that he inspired much of my prayer around this homily because today's gospel lesson is about many things, but it's also about pruning. And if there's anybody who knew anything about pruning, it was the good doctor. You know, the Bible is rife with agricultural metaphors. And out of all the metaphors we are most likely to come into contact with, I think it's safe to say that we are more likely to tend a plant than we are to shear a sheep. And I'd lay a bet on it right now that you have all pruned a bush, a flower, or a hedge recently. You know what? 
After watching enough HDTV at my house, I've come to learn that pruning sometimes encourages an increase in the yield of a specimen and can even be a catalyst for growth. I think we lose something in translation if all pruning means to us is that when it's time, we remove dead branches. And in a spiritual sense, we've probably heard encouragement in some form or another asking us to do just that. You know, what can we remove from our life that may be causing our vine to wither? And don't get me wrong. I mean, that is an important question worthy of much discernment in our life. But pruning as a practice, as a spiritual skill, now that's interesting. I think it has other aspects to it ones that we should be aware of if we are going to try to produce the yield, the spiritual yield that the gospel hopes. In some sense, I think when we read the Bible, an agricultural background is assumed. Does that make sense? A lot of talk about shepherds, a lot of talk about grapes, vine dressing and gleaning. But in the case that this is a little out of our wheelhouse, here are some helpful do's and don'ts from an entity that knows how to prune the best, the Arbor Society. Do. Do prune to standards. Recognize that there are certain seasons and places in your life when pruning is most helpful. This requires care and for us to really pay attention to our context in order to discern the right time for the work we must do. Do remember that poor pruning can cause damage that lasts a lifetime. Contrary to plucking out eyes or cutting off limbs so that you can enter the kingdom maimed, pruning is not the process of maiming. It serves the plant and takes into consideration life before one cuts. And do assess your pruning needs after a storm. We all have storms. You know them the best. Sometimes after a storm, it's easiest to see what needs to be removed. Don't. Don't prune without good reason. Production and yield are factors as the gospel suggests, but sometimes pruning before it's time puts the integrity of the specimen in jeopardy. Think about the long arc of your growth. Don't. Remove 25% of foliage during the growing season. If it's growing well, let it be. Didn't the beetle say that? An experienced gardener once told me that to let things grow to their full height, meaning let it achieve its full potential. And if you need a biblical background story for that, think of the wheat and the tares. 
don't prune something newly planted unless you are removing dead or broken branches. And I confess that I'm thinking about those folks who are new today, hearing me read off stuff from the Arbor Foundation. Realize that you're in good soil here. Do not prune something within 10 feet of a utility conductor. Oh, I snorted. Sometimes there are things in our lives that require caution, especially if we discern it necessary to prune something that if done improperly, can draw large amounts of current. You know where the energy is in your life. If you need to do some pruning around that, be careful. Don't try to tackle a pruning job that requires you to use heavy machinery. Sometimes we need help. Leverage what's available to you. Whether that's priests, doctors, therapists, or spiritual directors. And don't discount your friends. Pray for perspective there. And when necessary, ask for help. Don't leave branch stubs or cut off the branch at its collar. When you prune something in your life, cut it flush. Make the decision and do it. And do it well. Decide to do it and give yourself the best chance at recovery. And this is probably the one that comes closest to home for me. Don't use wound paint. Remember back in the 80s when they used to cut off tree limbs and they used to paint, paint black stuff over what they had cut, cut? Remember that? Sort of sealed the wound? Don't do that. We don't like scars, but they happen. They happen because life happens. But in order for things to heal, sometimes it means you need to let them breathe. And finally, don't strip out inner foliage or branches. Sometimes thinning is good, but one does not need to thin so much of their life that the only foliage that is left is what's at the end. We need substance in our lives. Let's find some together. Above all, remember that modern gurus and specialists abound. You can find them on talk shows and on blogs or all over our iPads, full of advice on how we should live our lives. And some of their suggestions are quite helpful. The best ones are borrowed from folk wisdom, good psychology, and even scripture once or twice removed. However, through it all, know that Jesus has already issued the invitation to illuminate your path by following his way, the way of truth and life. And though pruning may not be the easiest, sometimes letting go is. Know that you are not alone when you decide to do that work. 
for the vine dresser is never nearer the branches than when he's pruning them. <laughs> 